Good morning. I'm Ryan. I'm his favorite son, Quentin. And today's reading is out of 2 Kings 6, 8 to 15. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. This is God's word for today. Good job. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, favorite son, Quentin. Good morning. You look better than you did last week. At least some of you do. Some of you look like you are glad that week's over. Uh, it's a real honor to speak again this morning. Um, Pastor Stan and Karen, our beloved lead pastors, are enjoying the final uh, weeks of their trip uh, that was provided for them as a result of their 30 years of service here at Horizon. What amazing people they are, and we're looking forward to getting all the wonderful stories when they return of their adventures and uh, their, their recent uh, break. So thank you for loving our pastors so well, and it's an honor for me to share this morning. I've been talking to you a little bit about uh, what to do when. Life brings to us things that we're not always expecting, and how do we handle that? What do you do when you had a plan and the plan doesn't work out? What do you do when you think you're doing the right thing, but it seems like the wrong thing? What do we do when we are overwhelmed by the circumstances that come our way or the situations that uh, find them their way into our schedule or perhaps this chapter of life that you're in that's different than the previous chapter that seemed to be so much joy and happiness and fun and adventure and all of a sudden I'm in a different chapter. Perhaps it's the responsibilities of a family that you didn't have before or perhaps it's uh, a new demand at work where the expectations of your performance are much higher than, than you ever remember. Uh, they just came because you're such a nice person and said, hey, we got a few other things we think we need you to do because you do them so well, which means you think, well, maybe I shouldn't have done so well, and then I wouldn't have to do all of these things. Perhaps it's the deadlines in school, and, and you... you uh, uh, many of you are out of school now, and you're grateful for that, and uh, many of our students are just thankful that last week was the last week, and now what? Maybe it's staying home, and you say, I'd rather be at school because of the expectations. I'm overwhelmed. Sometimes we're overwhelmed with grief. Something that <clears throat> we once enjoyed is taken from us. It might be a person. It may be a position. It may be a place in life where you are feeling the pain and the overwhelming sense of grief or guilt. Perhaps you're here this morning and you feel the guilt of failure. Perhaps there's some things that you didn't expect to do that you did and you know are not pleasing to the Lord, nor are they uh, probably your moral standard if you were to try to explain that to someone. Perhaps it is a grudge. Somebody has said something. Somebody has done something. It seems unfair. It's not even true. It was an accusation that, that uh, just deeply hurt your heart. Your soul was cut to the quick. And you are feeling the overwhelming sense of grudge 
uh, that uh, every time you see that person or hear their name, you, you have this overwhelming sense of, of disappointment, perhaps, or even more than that. Something that, oh, I wish God would get even with that person. Perhaps it's a fear or frustration. All these things can be burdens in our lives that we don't expect. And so the question this morning, and let me ask you this, have you ever felt overwhelmed? Have you ever felt overwhelmed? In the first service this morning, Pastor Brogan and Sarah were here, and uh, we were so glad to see them. We met the twins. They have twin babies that just came uh, a few uh, weeks ago, and they are getting adjusted, and we got to meet them and hold them. And they, all of uh, the, both girls smiled at me. I'm not sure what that means, but I think they liked me. And, uh, but can you imagine being overwhelmed with congratulations, you are now parents for the first time of twins. Wow, 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 wow. You know, even the prophet Isaiah, you know, we think, we read about these great men of God. Isaiah has a good book in the Bible. It's one of the longest books you'll find in the Bible, and it's filled with wonderful things. But right in the middle of Isaiah's mission, look at what he says. Lord, I'm overwhelmed. Please, please come to my help. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Even mighty men of God like Isaiah have prayed that prayer, and I'm sure all of us have at moments said, Lord, where are you? I feel overwhelmed. This morning, I would like to get into your heart and into your spirit a verse that is so meaningful from what uh, was read to us just moments ago. It's verse 16 of 2 Kings chapter 8. And this is what it says, don't be afraid, said the prophet, or the prophet answered, those who are with us, those who are with us are more than those that are with them. Uh, may I read it again? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those that are with them. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. I had a good friend of mine. He was one of my uh, small group leaders. He's also a deacon in our church. Never missed. Earl Sanquist, his wife Marilyn. Uh, they are wonderful, wonderful people. So Earl was a state patrolman. In fact, he was a, a captain. That meant he had some responsibilities beyond just driving around in a car. But on occasion, his small team had to break up the assignments, and he often drove and uh, took care of the night shift, the night shift in rural counties in the state. And he um, shared an event that took place. He was out on a rural highway, and he uh, saw a drunk driver moving all over the road dangerously. And so, well, he did what he was trained to do. He pulled that driver over for the safety of the driver and perhaps for others. Now, when he pulled him over, he knew that he was out in the middle of uh, the county. He knew that he had no uh, immediate backup. In fact, he knew that if he called for backup, it may take 30 minutes or more for someone to come because they were in little communities that didn't have police departments and there were only a few sheriff uh, patrolling at that hour. As he pulled the car over, he did what he was trained to do, and he did what he trained others because he taught at the academy on occasion. He exited his patrol car, and the driver that he pulled over jumped out of the car. And he's described as a guy who was about seven foot one and weighed several hundred pounds. He was bigger than life. And as Earl looked at him, this drunk madman... And he realized he was about six foot one to three, somewhere in there, slightly built, well-experienced officer, that this would be a battle for life. This would be battle for life. But what happened in the next few seconds would never be forgotten. And I don't want you to forget what happens here in this story that was so nicely read to us today. 
I pray the Holy Spirit will help us when we are in moments when we are overwhelmed with circumstance and burdens of life and change of, of, of agendas and, and things that are beyond our expectation. And look at what we read here. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those that are with them. I think God does allow us to have moments where we feel overwhelmed, where the burden seems a little heavier than we expected. He does this, in my opinion, and as we see in Scripture, to help us mature in our faith. He does this to help sharpen us. It's not always like what we signed up for, but sometimes when we are overwhelmed with life experience, he's doing that to mature us. And actually... He does that so that at some point you can sit across the table with somebody, they have a cup of coffee and they say, hey, tell me your story. And you're able to share how in the midst of being overwhelmed, you came through that. And the lessons that you learned that you can pass on to your children and your family and your, your uh, friends. And sometimes people you don't really even know who are inquiring about why you have such great faith. Why you can pray fervently and seek the Lord. That when you have gone through an overwhelming moment or you are living in an overwhelming time frame or chapter in your life, that you have something to share and that you can see great things happen. So the reality of it is, is that there are overwhelming moments in our lives. Unexpected, unforeseen, unpredicted. Something that perhaps you are in right now and this week. And 2 Kings chapter 6 contains a powerful message for right now, how we can respond to this. One of the most colorful and dynamic men in the Bible is named Elisha. Everybody say Elisha. His name means God is my salvation. Bill means, uh, we have a bill coming at the end of the month. But Elisha's name means God is my salvation. Isn't that powerful? Now, there's another name in the Bible within a few chapters earlier that is different, but it's very similar. In fact, unfortunately, on occasion, I have been mistaken by using the wrong name, and that name is Elijah. Elijah. So you have Elisha and Elijah. Elijah comes first. By the way, First and Second Kings are an ongoing narrative, and although they are divided in our English Bible, so we can be proud that we read another book of the Bible, perhaps, this long story like First Chronicles and Second Chronicles is a continuation of the narrative, but different seasons or different times. And in these closing chapters of First Kings, as you come into Second Kings, you see a shift in, in change in leadership. You can read about this in your bedtime story reading tonight in Second Kings chapter 2. You're going to see a dynamic thing that happens. Elijah whose name means Jehovah is my God, and Elisha have an encounter. Elijah is a great prophet that performed at least eight remarkable miracles in the Bible. that You will see amazing stories. And he is told by God to anoint Elisha to take his place. Here's the great news. God always has a voice for every generation. God has a voice for your generation, and some of you are going to be that voice. God has a voice for all of us in the here and now generation. He raises up voices to be declaring the love of God and salvation. So you have Elijah, Jehovah is my God. Elisha, God is my salvation. It's kind of like Robert and Bob. They're very close, but don't call Robert Bob and don't call Bob Robert. Or they will perhaps say, you got the wrong person. Robert and Bob, Elijah and Elisha. And you have this great encounter. Now, Elisha is a farm boy. He, uh, he is out in, the, in doing his job when Elijah shows up. And Elijah said, that's the man. And Elisha says, I want to be the man. And so they come. They have this prayer of anointing. And here's what Elisha prays. Lord, I admire Elijah. 
He's an amazing guy. Everybody knows all about it. He's called Fire Down from Heaven. He's resurrected a child. He has, uh, uh, has seen you work in a mighty way. He's seen uh, things happen that are unbelievable, but we read them in the Bible. They're called miracles. Now, I counted, Lord, eight of them. I want twice as many in my life. Don't ever be afraid to believe God for more than what you've seen somebody else experience in your life. And so he has this anointing come upon him because the Bible will record that Elisha experienced 16, 16 remarkable miracles through his life. That doesn't mean it was all easy. In fact, as we read this morning, we see this double portioned prophet Elisha now as Elijah is caught up in a chariot and goes to heaven. Never dies, by the way. He just goes right up to heaven. Elisha watches all of this. Gets the mantle, if you will, the anointing. And now Elisha is the voice of God for his generation. Israel's been in a mess. They have been in a mess because they've made a lot of decisions that were not godly. They got off course. They drifted from God. And there's a king by the name of ben Hadda, uh, the king of Aram, who wants to listen to this. It's very interesting. It goes right along with what's happening today. He wants to totally wipe out Israel. He wants to get rid of them. And so he makes plans to attack and wipe them out. He is a terrorist. He, um, he hates Israel and God's people. But each time that they have plans to do this, God speaks to Elisha and reveals the plan and Elisha sends that message to the king of Israel. Look at verse 11. Tell me which of us on the side, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel. Now what happens is every time we'll call him King Ben from Aram is trying to attack Israel. Israel finds out about it and they move. But the king, the king Aram from Aram, King Ben, he thinks that one of his cabinet is revealing the secret. Have you ever been in a meeting and the chairman of the meeting says, now this is confidential information. And what, what, what do you want to do? You want to go home and tell somebody. But you know you're not supposed to. But the king thinks that somebody in his cabinet is revealing what's going on, the plan. So, he calls his cabinet together. And he says, okay, who's on the king's side here? And finally, after a long period of silence, one of the officers on the cabinet speaks up. And in verse 12, he says, none of us, my lord, the king, said one of the officers, but Elisha, oh, there's his name, that prophet guy, the prophet who is in Israel. Listen to this, isn't this, I don't know if you'll find this anywhere else in the Bible. It says, tell the king of Israel the, he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Now, how would you like to, to know that the pastor knows everything you talk about at your house? He knows how you talk to your spouse. He knows how you talk to your kids. He knows how you talk to your parents, your teachers, your employees. He knows everything you absolutely say. What do you think about that? Would you change your conversations? The reality is, is God does know everything that we say. And here's what you see happens. Verse 13, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. And the report came back. He is in Dothan. He is in Dothan. Isn't it interesting that Elisha is an obstacle to one nation and he's a deliverer to another nation? Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we are put in situations that were obst obstacles to the enemy, but we are a blessing to God's people. And I love the story here because I see a person who prays and seeks the Lord and asks, Lord, give me revelation, give me insight, give me wisdom, give me knowledge to know how to respond when I am dealing with an overwhelming experience. And as we read on in the story, we see how this all happens. Seek the Lord and pray. Understand the that God does raise up people to pray. And when we, they pray, we should, never, uh, we should never neglect or resist 
or, or in some ways criticize their praying because we realize what a great impact they have. For example, when they pray, the weapons that they are using are not the weapons of this world or they're not, as the scripture says, carnal, but they're mighty in God to pull down strongholds. So when you are in an overwhelming situation, you see that prayer makes a great difference because we can deal with the enemy of our soul in prayer and not be overwhelmed. And so we fast forward. And here Elisha and his assistant are in Dothan, the city of Dothan. They have camped out. They got their tent up. They, uh, it says in verse uh, 14, what happens? They're sleeping there in this town. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. So here's the story. So uh, Elijah's associate, his assistant, his servant, uh, gets up early. He goes and checks the mules, makes sure everything's okay. He makes the coffee, does the uh, toast, and he's got it all set up. And he looks up and he sees surrounding the city was the enemy's army. King Ben's army is around them with chariots and horses and armament. And it's almost more than you can believe. He is overwhelmed with panic he is overwhelmed with the circumstance. He rushes into the tent and he tells the prophet, and this is what he says in verse 15. When the servant saw all of this down at the end of the, the verse, oh my Lord, what shall we do? <laughs> Sounds like Bill Wilson on occasion. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? What do we do now, Lord? I thought we were in your will. I thought we were doing your, your guidance and direction in my life. I thought I was being a good dad. I thought I was doing my job that was assigned to me. But what do I do now? I'm overwhelmed with what I see. That's what the servant says. So what is the response? What is the response? When, uh, when we pastored uh, 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 in Los Angeles, um, we had a staff meeting, a pastoral meeting. I was the youngest pastor at the time, and I was uh, considered the youth pastor, the young, the young people's pastor. And uh, the Lord was really helping us, blessing us, and, and we were living in the big city of Los Angeles. Uh, neither Joy nor I had lived in a, the city this size, but um, we would meet every week as a pastoral staff, and you say, what do you do? Well, we talk about the upcoming services and events. We'd look at the calendar. We'd pray together. We'd make assignments. We'd check on people that had been missing or perhaps are in the hospital or whatever. And we tried to be a cohesive team. So in my, the pastor's office was the, uh, the official door that everybody came through when they wanted to come and see him. And there was a wonderful uh, assistant who would uh, help pastor with his, uh, his schedule and he was in a lot of demand. And then there was a little side door that went out into a hallway. And uh, that was like the escape door, right? So like if the pastor didn't want to see that person, they just went, sorry, he's not here. He left. No, it wasn't necessarily that, but it was the door that he would use to go to his car, etc. So we're in the staff meeting, having a staff meeting, and somebody knocked on that door, that, the, the side door. Not the uh, main door, the side door. And Pastor Sanders, uh, his name of the pastor, he said, come in. And the door opened very slowly, and then somebody leaned in. I'm sitting there just listening. I wonder who's interrupting. I said, this is a very important meeting. Don't they know that we're together here? And I leaned in, and you know who it was? It was my wife, Joy. And she had a big smile on her face. And she said, congratulations, Bill. You're going to be a father. What? I didn't go to father school yet. I was overwhelmed at that moment. They say that it took the staff several minutes to resuscitate me from falling over in a coma. Um, I, had, I was overwhelmed. I had a dad. He was a good dad. But I'd never been a father. What, how's this going to change my life? I mean, like, what, what are we going to do? Uh, do we have to buy uh, furniture now? Do we, what do, do we have enough money to have children? 
Do, do we have to get another car? Do we have to get a car seat? I mean, all these things in a media. How's this going to change? Joy is a very important part of my ministry. Is like she going to take a vacation for a while? Um, how am I going to handle the next nine months of being pregnant? Oh, that's right. She's pregnant, but I'm going to... Overwhelming. And that's life. And many of us have had those experiences. How do you respond to them? Let me just give you four things quickly that I think can help us. Because we can either fear and panic or we can move forward in faith and peace. And the first thing is I have to decide to live by God's agenda. Elisha made that decision out in the farmland of watching his cattle. And he had to decide, am I going to do what God called me to do or am I going to do my own thing? Look at verse number 16 again. He says, don't be afraid. This is what the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What was Elisha doing? He was fulfilling God's agenda. Now, if you're going to start to depart from God's agenda for your life, I'm going to assure you there's going to be a lot of overwhelming experiences. If you're going to decide to follow God's agenda, I'm going to assure you that there are going to be a lot of situations that are overwhelming at times. His resume read, farmer and bald-headed guy. One, on one occasion, Elisha was out watching, uh, walking down the road, and uh, he, uh, he, saw, he encountered some teenagers who started to make fun of him because he was bald-headed. And you know what this man of God did? He called out some bears to beat up these young teenagers, and they went scurrying for their lives. So do not make fun of any pastors who do not have a lot of hair or have a receding hairline because you might uh, encounter some bears, okay? Now, Elisha has been a prophet for 50 years now at this very moment, and he's still a mouthpiece of God. And the reason was he committed himself to follow God's guidance. If I could say anything to these fine young people on the front row, and thank you for sitting on the front row, bring all your friends. Let's fill up the whole thing with uh, your friends, okay? And let me just say this. If you can do anything successfully in life, follow God's agenda. Because God will take you through life and there will be challenges. But if you know I'm doing what God called me to do, Listen to me, dads. If you know what God's called you to do, moms, if you know what God's called you to do, you can come through anything because there's more with you. God is with you than those that are in the world. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 is just kind of a side verse. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So when God prepares you and you are doing his will for your life, it's a wonderful place to be. Know that God's agenda is bigger than yours. Know that God's agenda will all be, always be more challenging than perhaps you expected, but it does cause you to trust God. Know that God's agenda for your life is always better and brings greater reward. Yes, your own agenda may sound good and look good and may bring some reward, but the rewards that you will really experience in life are going to be greater because you're going to see things that you never thought possible. You're going to do things you never thought you could ever do. You're going to go places you never dreamed you would go. You're going to have conversations with people that you would have never had had you not been in God's agenda. It will affect you, your family, and those around you. It will affect the church of Jesus Christ, and it will even change the culture that we live in today, God's agenda. So when you feel overwhelmed, the first thing I would suggest is decide to live by God's agenda. Secondly, determine to practice the presence of God. This is what Elisha determined to do, live in the presence of God. At every moment, I know I'm not alone. He goes beside, before, behind. He is with me and I'm with him. Look at number, uh, verse number 17. And Elisha prayed, open the eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around him. 
when you start to practice the presence of God in your life, you begin to have what we call spiritual LASIK surgery. All of a sudden, those things that have caused uh, distortion, a lack of clarity, maybe uh, feeling a little bit of loss, you can't see the fine print, all of a sudden you can see things. And when you are following God's agenda, and you determine to practice his presence, it's amazing that in his presence is fullness of joy, and that as his right hands are pleasures forevermore. It is amazing that you have this sense of confidence that comes, because God is showing you things that you didn't see before. You now are seeing God at work, and not the devil at work. We used to sing a song way, 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 way back in the old days, back in the 2000s. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see Jesus. If I was to walk into your school with you, I would say, Lord, open our eyes that we can see you at work here. If I was to get on a plane and go with you to your next business trip, I would say, Lord, open our eyes. Help us to practice your presence, even in the most difficult of situations. I have been in very intense, contentious meetings, sitting in amongst people, and I've said, Lord, you got to show up in this situation, and we can begin to see what God will do. Why is this important? We live in a community that greatly needs the love of God, and the only way that that's going to change is for us to live in the presence of God. We need to follow His agenda we need to practice knowing he is with us. It's interesting. When I was a kid, the space uh, race began. People were going up into space. And the first cosmonauts from Russia went up into space. And this is what one of the cosmonauts said when he got back. First thing he said, I looked for God everywhere and I searched the heavens and didn't find God. I didn't even see him. Therefore, there is no God. That was his conclusion. It was everywhere, as I recall. He was an atheist, and all the atheists applauded him and said, isn't that great? That proves there is no God. Three weeks later, John Glenn, who was a born-again believer, got into a U.S. space capsule was shot up into the air. He circled the earth. And this is what he said when he landed. I saw God everywhere. I felt his presence, his glory. I felt him with me. I saw him everywhere. One didn't see a thing, and the other one had his eyes wide open. Which one was right? They both were. Because one, eyes were, one man's eyes were closed to God's presence, and another man's eyes were open. Isn't that interesting? When you accept Christ as your personal Savior and accept what Jesus has, can do in your life, and you start to practice the presence of God, it's amazing where God, you'll find God at work in your midst, his kingdom at work. Thirdly, I'm going to suggest that you depend on the provision of God when you are overwhelmed. If you are acting like it depends all on you, I'm going to tell you right now, Dad, it's not going to work out. You'll be overwhelmed. Look at what Isaiah's, or 2 Kings in Elisha says, verse 18. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. Now, this is interesting. The verse before, or two, he's asking for God to open a guy's eyes. Now he's asking the Lord to close somebody's eyes. Isn't that interesting? You see that? The contrast? God knows what he needs or, uh, to do at the right time. In this case, these enemy army people are all around him, and he says, close their eyes. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had said. Earlier, we see the Lord opening the eyes of the servant, and what did he see? He opened his eyes, and he saw the army of heaven around them with fire all around, the chariots of fire. In other words, that's what Elisha was saying all along. 
I'm praying your eyes will be open and you'll see God and his presence at work. And now I'm praying that the enemy's eyes will be closed and they will be closed. I want to suggest to you that you depend on the provision of God. And finally, dwell in the peace of God. When I'm overwhelmed, I decide I'm going to live God's agenda. I've got to make sure I'm doing what God wants me to do. I've secondly got to to determine that I'm going to practice the presence of God every day. Invite him into my world. Make sure I'm aware that he's with me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'm going to depend that he'll provide what I need for just the right moment. I'm going to also dwell in the peace of God. When I read through this story again and again, I see the peace of God, the calm, the cool, the collected, the composed, the confident, all of these things. And when you pick up reading chapter uh, 6, verses 19 through 23, you will see that this blind army of the enemy, King Ben's army, who has come to take Elisha and his servant back, and who knows what would happen to them, Elisha shows up and they say, hey, you know, we're all blind now. And Elisha says, hey, follow me. Follow me. And he leads them. He said, you're in the wrong place. They were the wrong place. And that army follows Elisha to Samaria. And Elisha takes that army right to the king of Israel. And there they are in the courtyard with all of these, the, what was a fierce army now, they're all blind and holding on to each other. And, and Elisha says, follow me, boys. Come on, keep say it with me. We're almost there. Where are we going? We're going to the right place. He says, they get there. And he says, here they are, king, the enemy's army. And the king says, what do you want me to do? Kill them all? And oh, no, 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 we don't need to kill them all. Just get some food together. Let's, let's serve our our enemies here. And then he said, Lord, open their eyes. And they opened their eyes. They ate the food. And Elisha sends them back to their king, King Ben. And the next verse says at the end, so the band from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. I'll be the first to admit, I don't know why certain things happen to you in your life. You look like good people. You look like people that don't deserve to go through stuff. You don't, you don't look like you're people that should be having to carry all the cares of the world. You feel like you go to the front door and there's a big bag and you got to put it on. It's all the cares and you got to walk around. People say, what's that? Oh, that's, that's the overwhelming burdens that I have to bear for my family or for my friends or for myself or whatever it might be. I don't know why some of those things come our way, but I can tell you, That as a pastor for many years, I I have watched over the years, people go through things in the presence and peace of God that are remarkable. So when you feel overwhelmed, don't be afraid. Those who are with us, with you, are more than those that are with them. So my friend Earl, who's a state patrol officer, gets out of his car to do what he's been trained to do, to approach the car when this giant of a man jumps out who's both drunk and mad, and he starts to come. And he said, I realized I was going to be a hand-to-hand combat with a guy that was much bigger than I, and this might be the last time I'm on duty. But the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he said, say these words. And he shouted out, Sir, stop. I'm not alone. And the Earl said to me, he watched the man completely come to a halt. He looked over my shoulder. His eyes got bigger than life. He fell to the ground, shaking. He put out his hands and said, please, 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 sir, take me in. I said, Earl, what did he see? Marilyn prays over me every time I go out on the road. And I know that God sent a giant angel 15 feet high, bigger than life, standing right behind me. And when I said, I'm not alone, he must have seen God's protection. He surrendered. When you're overwhelmed, please, please never, remember, never forget, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. God's at work even when it seems like unbearable, unbearable. 
2 Kings 6 reminds us, decide to live God's agenda. Determine to practice the presence of God. Depend on the provision of God. Some of you are under a lot of stress right now, and you're saying, Lord, where are you? What's going on? I feel overwhelmed. There's an army around me. Let God provide for you in a way that you can share with your family. Look what God's done. And live in the constant presence of the Lord that he is always with you. Would you pray with me this morning? Some of you need to surrender all to Jesus. You come just as you are. And I'm going to pray a simple prayer, and I invite all of you to pray that prayer. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not asking you to come forward, although that's always a good idea from time to time. But today, right where you are, if you're making a commitment, you can walk out of this room knowing that God has come into your life because you invited him. And you've said, Lord, I set aside my agenda for yours. Would you pray everyone in this room to encourage those who may be praying for the first time or a prayer of renewal? Out loud these words, Dear Heavenly Father, I surrender my agenda to you. Help me to follow your lead. Forgive me of my sin and make me the person you want me to be. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord heard that prayer. And whatever burden you have come with today, whatever overwhelms you, you've given it to the Lord, and I'm going to do God's will, and he's going to provide for me. I'd like every father that is here, or expectant father, if you would just stand to your feet this morning. I feel compelled to pray over you today. Would you just stand if you're a dad, you have kids, you're expectant, father, wife's just knocked on the pastor's door and told you you're going to be a father, please stand. Now, if you're near one of these wonderful men, would you just stretch your hand out towards the... Thank you for being here, guys. This says a lot about who you are. Father, I pray over these men today. I thank you for them. I pray as they take on their responsibilities again. Some have moved way down the line in their responsibility, but they're still a dad at heart. They still have grandkids. Others are just beginning. Some have children at home. Lord, I pray your blessing, your anointing, and may they truly follow your lead in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's put our hands together for these men. Let's stand together.